This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back once again to another episode of the Human Action Podcast, the podcast where we read and cover and hopefully encourage you to study the great books in Austrian economics, in political theory, and related topics. And if you've been following along, you know that a couple weeks ago, we started our multi-show walk through Murray Rothbard's two-volume, An Austrian Perspective on the History of Economic Thought. And we really enjoyed having Dr. Patrick Newman join us for those early two episodes where we went into uh, Economic Thought before Adam Smith, which is most of volume one of this two-volume. And as promised, today we're going to really roll up our sleeves and go through uh, Adam Smith and his influence, not just on England, but on the entire continent of Europe. And I thought I would get uh, two of my good friends, two great guests, another Newman, Dr. Jonathan Newman. A lot of you know him from his writings here at Mises.org. He's also a professor of economics at Bryan College in Tennessee. And my friend Hunter Hastings, another name you're probably familiar with. He writes at Mises.org. He runs our Economics for Business, E for B platform, and also does a podcast by the same name there. So Hunter, Jonathan, great to talk to both of you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you for having us. Well, Hunter, I got to admit, um, I was a little self-indulgent here. I like the idea of an Englishman defending a Scot. So I, I, I thought <laughs> I'd bring you on for Adam Smith. And, you know, big picture, overarching, if you just start uh, this portion of the book, which for those who are reading along, we're, we're specifically discussing chapters 15, 16, and 17. In other words, the final three chapters of volume one. Boy, oh boy, Hunter, um, he goes after Adam Smith pretty hard. I mean, he calls him retrograde. He says, uh, Cantillon, not Adam Smith, was the founder of modern economics. Uh, he says he put us uh, you know, behind in terms of our understanding of uh, value and cost theory. I mean, uh, th this reads a little bit like a polemic with respect to Smith. Well, it does. And uh, Dr. Patrick Newman was very upfront about that in episode two of this series where he said that Murray Rothbard had an open tendency to choose the individuals he supported and the theories he supported and those he didn't. And he was very, he was very direct about it. And this is one of those cases. I think polemic is a good word, but it's also uh, ad hominem. He, he calls Adam Smith a plagiarist. He calls him uh, incalcitrant and, and uh, various other things. So the, the polemic is deliberate and it's to set up the last seven or so paragraphs of, of chapter 17, which I'm sure we'll get to during this discussion of the uh, negative effect of Smith on the development of economics. So that's his purpose. And then so he sets out from the very beginning, the very first words of chapter 16 in uh, destroying the, the legend of Adam Smith as he sees it. So yes, it is a polemic, it's deliberate, but it's got a cause. Well, I'm curious what your thoughts are on chapter 15, the Scottish Enlightenment, because at the outset of that chapter, uh, Rothbard indicates that intellectual think, uh, thought and economics had been shifting away from England and towards, in other words, away from the power centers of Oxford and Cambridge towards uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh. And it appears that Rothbard considers this a devolution. And I think you're a Cambridge man, so I guess I'll let you speak to that. Well, I've, I will not defend Cambridge. I got an awful education there. And interestingly, in my uh, master's program in economics, there was no mention of Adam Smith. It was 100% keen. So I'll give you that as background. But um, I think the Scottish Enlightenment is a bit of an overblown term for uh, the emergence of a couple of centers in Scotland, Edinburgh and Glasgow, and the, the teachers who, who populated them. Uh, which was a great development for Scotland. I mean, it was a backward feudal, feudal country, and this was a little bit of a, an emergence there. Um, I leave all the details of this, the Enlightenment in Scotland to Jonathan, but I would note a couple of things. One, it, it is usually reported as more empirical uh, than the tradition of the French or even the English uh, Enlightenment, if there was such a thing. We should think of the French Enlightenment, I suppose. Um, and secondly, one of the interesting elements is that it was system building. So Hutchison's great work is called A System of Moral Philosophy. And Smith talked about building um, his system of natural liberty. And 
he attacks the mercantilist system and replaces it with his own. So there's an element of, of systems thinking, as we'd call it today in the Scottish Enlightenment, which is distinctive, I think. Jonathan, let's talk a little bit about your take on chapter 15. I specifically want to get into Hume, who Rothbard, I think, treats pretty well, but gives him a little bit of a mixed review. Yeah, so Rothbard's really uh, good about that. He's he's good at, you know, just not exalting somebody and saying every or trying to defend everything that they said. But he's also, in my opinion, he's good at not just, you know, putting somebody down. And if they have, you know, maybe a majority of their views are incorrect, he he. He doesn't let that bias his views of everything that they've written. And I think he does the same thing with Hume as well as the other um, authors in uh, chapter 15, or really the whole book. Uh, so he, he points out some of the good things about Hume. So uh, Hume uh, went a long way towards uh, defeating mercantilist ideas, uh, ideas about uh, countries should have policies that involve them hoarding gold, basically. So we need to uh, restrict uh, the trade between countries such that we have, you know, gold piling up in our own country. So Hume's uh, specie flow mechanism and what he talked about there was, it went a long way towards, you know, getting people to understand that these protectionist policies really aren't in our in our own interest. So, so Rothbard does give him credit for that. However, um, like I mentioned before, he, he doesn't just, you know, just blast and he doesn't just praise. He says that Hume missed out on some of the micro level things that we do see in Cantillon, uh, which actually it's another good uh, signal or another good part of uh, it sort of d displays Rothbard's project of looking at the history of economic thought, not as an onward and upward project where everything that comes later is better. Uh, but he says that, you know, sometimes we, sometimes we drop the ball. Sometimes when we're, when a science is being developed or when economics is being developed, it, it looks like certain authors, they forget or maybe they, they didn't realize the full extent of what previous authors uh, read or, or wrote, excuse me. And so Rothbard shows here that Hume missed out on something that came earlier in the history of economic thought. And Rothbard says, actually, Cantillon was right to look at the, the micro level mechanics of of money in an economy, specifically through Cantillon effects, that Hume didn't really have in his own analysis. But, you know, Jonathan, I'm struck today, we just think, well, you should have read the literature and you should have known better. But back then, the, you know, there were both geographic and temporal elements to this. It wasn't so easy to know what the Spanish scholastics said 150 years earlier uh, in the 18th century. I mean, this kind of, this is a bit of hindsight here. You're right. So we can't, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have Wikipedia. They they didn't have a Google Scholar where they could look up some search term and see what what anybody has ever written about this one particular topic. Uh, and I think I think Rothbard is pretty careful to not necessarily say that they have like intentionally, like Hume intentionally left out Cantillon's ideas, uh, but you know just left it open. Where if he did know about it, then he's he's intentionally dropped it or or thought it was wrong. And so he didn't bring it into his own analysis or he just you know, didn't know about it. But there, it, Rothbard does point to certain cases where these authors knew about each other, uh, like the case of uh, Smith and Turgot. So there was a brief stint uh, in Smith's life in his career where he was in uh, France and he actually uh, met with uh, Turgot. And I'm sure they discussed all sorts of things, including economics. You know, what's happening in this era in the 18th century in London in Scotland and also in France, it reminds me of Vienna. In other words, great minds tend to congregate and they learn and build upon each other's work. It's not something that tends to happen in isolation. But I want to get back to, you mentioned uh, Rothbard praises Hume on this price specie flow mechanism uh, concept. And I want to draw readers' attention to page 426 of the book, because I think this is great stuff. I think it's relevant not only to what's going on today in the United States, with the money and credit creation by the Fed and the Treasury, but also in Bitcoin circles, there's a lot of talk about stock to flow and money supply and does the money supply matter. So first, uh, Hume's got this great line here about how, you know, if every man in Great Britain got five pounds more slipped into his pocket overnight, the next day prices would just adjust and we'd be no better off. So I think I hate to say it, Jonathan, but we're still fighting this idea that more money in and of itself, especially not commodity money, uh, makes us richer when, in fact, it, it doesn't 
what makes us richer is more goods and services produced more productively. Uh, but then also he goes into this uh, price species flow mechanism, which explains why if a country, for example, uh, radically increases its money supply quickly, um, that makes in turn makes imports uh, more attractive than uh, domestic goods. And as a result, more money flows out of the country and that this tends to balance out over time. So I, I want to say that in Hume's time, this was a, a pretty deep insight. Oh, oh, certainly. So, uh, hindsight, we can look back and say, you know, this isn't quite right, or he didn't, you know, fully think about this. He didn't take into account Cantillon effects, or later uh, Rothbard talks about uh, the fact that Hume focused more on the the price uh, mechanism. So the the money coming into the into one country works to bid up the prices of of the of the goods in that country, and so that's what causes all of the the self reversing aspects of the of the money supply shifting between countries. Um, but and Rothbard points out that there's actually this income effect as well um, that Hume could have taken into account. So in hindsight, we can say all sorts of things, uh, but we really, I mean, we should. Uh, consider the fact that these these men who are writing this stuff they 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 didn't have the internet they didn't have hindsight they didn't have hundreds of years of economic theory you know they didn't have internet forums that they could look at and see people quib quibbling about things they didn't have Mises University you know <laughs> all, all the stuff that we that we take for granted today and so it's easy for us to point and say hey they didn't get this they how, how could how could Hume be so stupid to not take this into into account but that's really not the the attitude that we should have. And of course, he, uh, he, meaning Rothbard, brings up Locke's quantity theory of money. And there's occasionally some confusion over this. Um, I think most of us would agree that all else equal, uh, creating a bunch of money, new money quickly will, will raise prices. But that's different than accepting in toto the, the so-called quantity theory of money, which here he ties to John Locke. Uh, and, and as you know, Jonathan, both Rothbard and Mises expressly wrote about QTM and rejected it. That's right. So the the rejection from the Austrians is based on on the fact that the the quantity theory of money it looks at these aggregates like the aggregate supply of money or the total supply of goods and services in an economy and it tries to come up with a relation between them uh, in the popular uh, Fisherian version from Irving Fisher it's the MV equals PQ or PT. Um, and so the argument from Rothbard and Mises is that you can't do that. So there's no there's no mechanical relationship between these aggregates. Uh, what's happening at the cause and effect level is it's individuals making choices. Individuals have their own money demand. Individuals have their own time preferences. And, and this is what determines uh, prices for individual goods and services. Uh, so when you when you try to blow it up and look at these big aggregates, or in the case of the classical economists, including these. Um, including Smith and, and Hume, a lot of times they'll try to look at one long run equilibrium and compare it to another long run equilibrium. You miss out on you miss out on the economics. You miss out on the actual cause and effect, which is at the micro um, individual level. And and one important uh, implication of this is that you if you look at the quantity theory of money in a crude sense, it makes it seem like the pri all prices rise proportionally or uh, all incomes and wages uh, rise proportionally when there's an increase in the money supply. Uh, when both Cantillon and later Austrians uh, showed or, or realized that it's, that's not the case, that when, when money is created, either by the Federal Reserve or through fractional reserve banking, it, it starts off as certain individual, or it comes into the economy through a particular point. So some individuals get an increase in their income, and then they use that to bid up the prices of the goods that they want to buy, which means the, the people who sell those goods have an increase in their income and so far. So there's like a ripple effect of incomes and prices increasing as opposed to these mechanical relations between aggregates like the quantity theory seems to suggest. Well, I guess I'll throw this out to both of you. When you read about the major figures in these last three chapters here, when you read about Carmichael and Hutchison and Hume and Adam Smith and uh, Jeremy Bentham, you know, Rothbard is so good at fleshing out. I mean, these guys were in no way, shape, or form what we would today consider economists in, in a standalone sense. It didn't exist as a standalone discipline. I mean, these guys are involved in law. They're involved in philosophy. They're involved in, in political matters, in logic. I mean, I mean, this was, in, in that sense, 
a profession, uh, if you want to call it that, that was more cognizable maybe to what we now call literary economists like Mises and Rothbard. In other words, very, m- more holistic, whereas d- today I- economists aren't talking about this kind of stuff at all. One of the terms we might use there, Jeff, is interdisciplinary. So this is in the era before the universities and our educators had divided all knowledge into silos, and you may not cross the silo boundaries. And today, we're just beginning to recognize that interdisciplinary thinking, uh, whether it's in economics or business or any part of the sciences or the arts, is the only way to arrive at new knowledge and and to be constructive and to be innovative. And so in a sense, they were ahead of their time. They were they were all interdisciplinary thinkers. Jonathan? So I, I really love the way Rothbard looks at the whole person. So you're exactly right. It's they're not these guys weren't just pure economists. You know, they show up to their, you know, desk job and they, you know, crunch numbers and well, I guess what people today consider economists or what they do. So, but these guys, they were theologians, they were philosophers, um, they, they, were, they wrote about many different topics. Um, and so I'm glad that you, uh, you referred to Mises and Rothbard in a similar vein, because they, they did the same. So Mises wasn't just an economist, but if you look at the first hundred page of human action, for example, it's, uh, it's, it's dense epistemology and philosophy um, as he's you know, laying the groundwork for his, uh, the rest of the economics treatise. And I think we've lost some of that. So not only Hunter mentioned that we've siloed off, but we've all, we've also siloed within silos. So in economics, in particular, if you look at any given department at a university, they don't have just a, a faculty group of of economists. They have you know one person is doing healthcare economics, another person is doing macroeconomics of a certain flavor that has to do with you know, like these very high-powered uh, macroeconomic models. Another person is doing labor economics. Another person is doing public choice. And so they're all doing their own very specific uh, thing within economics. And what what you notice is that when whenever they try to talk with each other or whenever they try to, you know, bring their models together, whenever there's any sort of synthesis at all, even just in the case of, you know, one person's presenting a paper to a group of economists that, that don't represent the same field as the paper that's being presented, there's, there's a lot of confusion. They don't even understand what's really going on between them. So that's it's such a huge difference uh, as to what we see in the history of economic thought, where these early economists weren't pure economists, but they were writing about all sorts of subjects. And Rothbard does a good job of showing how, how their philosophical beliefs or theological beliefs, or even their own, their other professions might have influenced their economic thinking um, especially in the case of, of Smith, he talked about his uh, Calvinist views and he talked about the influence of uh, Presbyterianism. And, and a really a, a big theme of the, of the book is the uh, Catholic versus uh, Protestant uh, thinkers and the, and the philosophies that underlie those uh, veins in, in Christianity and how that, that, how that has influenced the history of economic thought. So it's, it makes for a more compelling narrative um, and it helps, you, it helps the reader make more sense of why these guys had the ideas that they did. Yeah, Rothbard never seems to side with a Puritan. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, he doesn't like reformers, let's just say. He tends to go down on the Catholic side uh, as a Jewish guy from Brooklyn, I suppose. Uh, I, I want to get now in, a little bit more into Smith himself. So at the beginning of chapter 16, which is titled The Celebrated Adam Smith, and then at the end of chapter 17, where the last few pages, as Hunter mentioned earlier, really go into a deep revisionist take on Smith and his influence and his place, I suppose, in the pantheon of economists, modern economists, anyway. Uh, So chapter 16 starts out, again, uh, Hunter mentions some pretty harsh language. He calls him a shameless plagiarist. He says he contributed nothing of value to economic thought. And actually, uh, his work was a grave deterioration from his predecessors, by which he means Cantillon, Spanish scholastics, etc. But what struck me, Hunter, was he goes a little bit into the personal life and and conditions of Adam Smith, who ends up with a pretty good sinecure and a pretty good salary and ends up making a lot more money than he would have with just a standard professorship at Glasgow or wherever. And I got to tell you, I had a little uh, thought there that 
that might be a little bit of sour grapes emanating from Marie Rothbard, who, of course, was never financially comfortable. Uh, you know, at NYU was on somewhat of Schusting, and really only later in life at UNLV that he had what we might consider a comfortable middle class existence. And uh, Smith lived pretty well, as you know, we'll find out later, as did Marx, for example. Uh, Smith lived pretty well. And, uh, you know, is this wise? To, should we con- consider the man? Uh, as much as the work, or is is Rothbard going astray here and revealing maybe too much of himself? Well, the two are unconnected. Smith earned his income after the theory of moral sentiments was published. He became very famous and very acclaimed, and that uh, resulted in him being hired by the Duke of Buckley, I think that's how you pronounce it, at the recommendation of David Hume to be the tutor of the Duke's son and go on a grand tour with him, which was a standard practice at the time. You went on a grand tour of Europe with your with your tutor. So, you know, it's not unlike Mengo, who's uh, hired as a, a, a tutor in the same kind of a way. So that's, you earned it. That was the commercial system of the time. And yes, you got a nice uh, salary for that. It was a lifetime uh, appointment. And that enabled him. He started writing The Wealth of Nations in France when he was out there. He met Turgot. Um, he cites Cantillon. I don't know whether he was uh, he ever met Cantillon, but that was part of his, uh, his profession at the time as a tutor. And then later in life, he took a job. He took a job as a, a customs inspector, the head of the, the customs inspectorate in the region. And so he was a laissez-faire capitalist who didn't make all of his money being a professor. He made it uh, in professional terms, first as a tutor and then as a uh, an employee of, of the government. So he earned his money. So Rothbard does have some praise for him, Hunter, that towards the outset of this chapter on his understanding of the importance of division of labor. And uh, this example, which Smith wrote about a pin factory, uh, you know, talk a little bit about that. What's Smith's insight here? Well, let me go back to systems building for a second, because uh, Smith himself, himself described the wealth of nations as a violent attack on the whole commercial system of Great Britain, um, by which he included the empire. So that included India and, and America at the time. Um, and he replaced it with a system of what he calls a system of natural liberty, but we would, we would think of it more as laissez-faire capitalism. So his first insight is that Wealth is not money, which sounds simplistic to us, but the mercantilist system was all built on accumulating bars of gold in, in the Bank of England. And if a country had more gold, then it was, it was more wealthy. And he said, no, that's not wealth. Wealth is the output of the capital and labor of the country. Uh, we would call that GNP or GNP per capita, although they didn't have that terminology then. And that was a major innovation of, at the time to think about that. So... Um, GNP per capita, how do you increase that? Well, you increase it through specialization and the division of labor. That's That results in productivity, and productivity can advance that way, and more and more specialization leads to uh, more and more productivity. The individuals doing the specialist tasks, he said, get better and better at it. They're not distracted by moving from one task to another. In the meantime, the technology, as we would say today, gets gets better and better and and more advanced. So um, you apply that in wider and wider markets, which is another insight of, of Smith. And so he builds his system on this idea of, of productivity per capita coming from labor and capital. He kind of incorporates land at the end, but land was a bit difficult back then because it wasn't counted in accounting. You just owned it. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was building a system from the bottom up, I would suggest, the the individual pin factory, and uh, that's that's how the system works. So I, it's a big modern insight. It's a big change from the mercantilist way of thinking. So Jonathan, this sounds like a guy Rothbard should like, but yet he he spends some time in this chapter pointing out all the ways in his view Adam Smith was not laissez-faire, for example, on uh, taxes and uh, usury. Yeah, and on the on the point of the division of labor, uh, Rothbard. He he does credit him with popularizing it, even though Rothbard did say that he exaggerated the importance of it. 
and sort of left other you know key features of an economy that would lead to its growth, like capital accumulation. Um, so, so Rothbard, it, it, he does credit you know Smith with you know getting a few things right. Um, even if Rothbard also says that the few things that he got right, he probably lifted from from other authors. Uh, but but you're right, Rothbard has this you know is uh, sort of a one two punch knockout here at the end of uh, chapter sixteen, where he's listing out all of the different regulations and taxes that um, Adam Smith was in in favor of. It's one of the few. Uh, I think I think it's maybe the only bullet point list in the book, or one of the few ones. Uh, where he's just listing out all of the different things, so like regulation of bank paper. He was in favor of public works, government coinage. He wanted the government in charge of the post office, other other sorts of you know public works type things like uh, firewalls, registration of mortgages, uh, restrictions on the export of corn, which is interesting considering that Adam Smith is seen as this this uh, destroyer of, of protectionist ideas. And uh, the outlawing or the practice of paying employees in kind, forcing all payment to be in money. So this is something that Rothbard would say. Well, how how could this guy who has all of these he he, he agrees with all of these policies? How could he be considered you know the leader of of free market thought? How how could he be considered the founder of this of this whole uh, you know set of ideas in economics that that we associate with class, classical liberalism or you know libertarianism? Well, and of course. Uh- a lot of that critique is based on what Rothbard considers Smith's uh, misunderstanding of any sort of theory of value, the idea that, that we, we look at cost of production even with respect to money, the you know, general labor cost of production uh, to apply even to the money commodity, which Rothbard says is a faulty theory of money. So I guess the thread that's going through all of it that, again, seems obvious to us in hindsight, not so obvious at the time, is that how do we determine uh, value and utility without understanding subjectivism and marginalism? And uh, Smith attempts to do so without uh, addressing subjectivism or marginalism. Well, Rothbard hits him, hits him on this as well. Uh, Rothbard says that um, we don't, we're not just relying on hindsight by saying that Adam Smith made this error in his value theory because Rothbard points to Adam Smith lectures that he made uh, years before he wrote The Wealth of Nations, where he actually did mention subjective value theory, where he he basically had solved the diamond water paradox. But then later on, when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, it, it seems like he, it's almost as if he forgot what he wrote before. So so we can't you know just say from hindsight, oh, Smith just didn't realize this. Rothbard shows that in, in his earlier lectures, uh, uh, Smith wasn't uh, consistent. Hunter? Well, I, I, this is all a matter of interpretation, and you can interpret things uh, in different ways. I would su- suggest that book two of The Wealth of Nations is entirely about uh, capital accumulation and the need for capital accumulation. And in fact, Schumpeter, who was no fan of Smith, um, credits Smith with one half of what he called the Kirk Togo Smith savings and investment uh, theory that that you need savings in order to invest to accumulate more capital, and that's how how economies grow with the application of the the uh, <clears throat> specialization of labor. And he, Smith accuses government of of uh, consuming capital, and you know that's a very Misesian kind of point of view. So it's just interpretation. The, Smith didn't misunderstand capital accumulation. He may not have have written about it very very fluently. The major um, problem, as, as Rothbard points out and you mentioned, is, is this whole issue of value. And again, if you take the positive interpretation of Smith, he made progress on the difficult problem of value. So the separation of value, of value in use and value in exchange, um, today we call the value in use part experience. And if you look at Dr. Mark Packard's um, value learning process. There's a component in there, which is exchange value. So the consumer buys something and then what he calls experience value. Well, that's value in use. So Smith at least knew enough to uh, separate the two. He thought of value as a process. Uh, value in use is obviously utilitarian as opposed to subjective. Um, but even so, um, 
Mark and, and Per Bailen's definition of subjective value is uh, the satisfaction which is felt in an act of consumption. So that's not very, very far from value and use. So my point is, if you're generous to Smith, you can say he made progress in the theory of value. If you're not generous, you can say he got it all wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, and part of this, uh, well, first of all, I like this. I like this uh, defense of Smith. I think this is healthy. And uh, there are some points here where I think, uh, Jonathan, I don't know if you agree, but I, I thought Rothbard was a little harsh. Um, but when you talk about this use of ex as experience, um, exchange use versus um, experience, for example. It, it's it's interesting that he had this focus, which Rothbard points out, on capital goods. So he didn't seem to care much about, let's say, the finished product like the chair in which you lounge. And so that, that lounging gives you leisure, which you consume in, in your leisure time. It seems like uh, he's pretty hung up on the idea of a productive versus unproductive capital and labor. So that, that strikes me as something pre-Austrian, for example. I'd also like to get your take, uh, I guess, Jonathan, on th this idea of natural price, which is a term that Smith uses. And it sounds to us like, well, uh, you know, a certain supply and demand is going to trend inexorably towards equilibrium. And most Austrians don't like that. They tend to say, no, 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 uh, prices are always instant. They're ever shifting on the market. And it's it's a waste of time to try to determine or go from an equilibrium model to understand the real world. Yeah, this was uh, something that became characteristic of the classical economists in general, uh, really started by Adam Smith, um, where they they like to they like to look at the long run equilibrium as opposed to the what we would now call the causal realist. Uh, workings of, of the market economy and the causal realism of individual choice. Um, but, but you're right, modern Austrians would say that prices are formed in real time by real people who have their own uh, preferences and their own expectations, their own information, their own stocks of the good that um, they might be buying or selling. And these things work together uh, primarily through the individual's preferences to 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 get at at least a, a range of possible prices. And Boom um, uh, did a great job of, of showing how that, that range of possible prices is based on the marginal buyers and sellers. And so the, the, my point is that the Austrians have this very, very detailed approach to how to price formation and what, what exactly are prices. But the classical economists in contrast, they, they wanted to see not just tendencies because they didn't really have uh, dynamics and they, they wanted to boil down these market phenomena that they see day to day into something that could be described by like one equation. Uh, Ricardo did this a lot, especially where he wanted to he wanted, you know, one sometimes simple equation to to explain something that actually has a, a, a pretty simple qualitative and intuitive explanation for its cause. Um, and we see the same thing with this idea of of natural price, uh, in Smith's case, he, he was basing it on the cost of production. And, and I think it, it's really interesting that you'll see Wealth of Nations published online in multiple places. So you'll see Wealth of Nations is, uh, you'll find like liberty organizations or, uh, associate, or organizations that have liberty in the name where they associate themselves with classical liberal ideas. They'll, they'll have their own text of of wealth of nations, but if you also go to Marxist.org and some other socialist um, organizations, they'll also have the full text of of wealth of nations, and, and which is really interesting because it seems like those ideas, like th those two ideologies, are opposed with each other. But I think it goes to show that there's a lot of vagueness in Smith's writing, and so it's it's easy. It, it's sort of like an ink blot, so you can sort of see what you want to see into Smith if. If you really like the classical liberal ideas, then you'll see a lot of that in Smith. However, if you don't like um, if you don't like markets, you don't like capitalism. You're worried about worker alienation, or you're you're worried about uh, capitalists getting surplus value. Then you'll latch onto the the parts of Smith where it seems in, in his vague his own vague wording, he's talking about uh, natural prices based on cost of production or labor theory of value. Um, or the the worker alienation in the case of the the his later writings on the division of labor, how workers you know if they specialize too much they're doing the same thing over and over again they get 
they get tired of their job and they turn into basically automatons for the economy. Well, let's let's talk about that real briefly, the distribution of the productive output of a country. Why don't I give Hunter the, the opportunity here? Is Rothbard wrong? Make the case for Adam Smith as a genuine founder or, or a genuine legend uh, and a proponent of laissez-faire capitalism. Is, is Rothbard all wet when he, when he questions uh, Smith's bona fides here? Um, I, would, I would make the case um, that he is a laissez-faire capitalist, and uh, I'm not sure a founder, but certainly a, uh, a very important proponent. He wasn't an anarcho-capitalist. Um, but if you read book five, it's like a pending power and market at the end of Man, Economy, and State. It's very anti-government. It's very uh, anti-intervention. Yes, he is in favor of some public works, but there weren't any big companies to undertake things like road building and, and so on at, at that time. And he talks about government um, dis distorting the economy, uh, siphoning money out of the the pockets of the people, uh, consuming capital. And he talks about the pretense of kings and ministers thinking that they can they can manage the economy. So he's certainly laissez-faire from a point of view of uh, leave people alone and they will come up with uh, with a self-functioning system that works well for everybody. That's the invisible hand, obviously. Um, he understood entrepreneurship. He didn't use that word. So, um, Cantillon used it as a French word, but if you read Cantillon's essays, a lot of anecdotes in there and you find the same anecdotes in Smith. So, uh, Cantillon has the anecdote of the merchant going to the local town or village to buy up the produce, taking it back to the city to sell it at a higher price. Smith has exactly the same, uh, anecdote. And, he has another word that he uses. He calls those people speculating merchants. So they buy at one price and they sell at a higher price. He also has a term he uses called projector, which sounds very strange to us, but it comes from projects. So he talks about projects for new markets, new geographies, new initiatives, new products. And he calls those projects and the people who start them in uncertainty Another word he didn't use, but implied, don't know what their profit is going to be, but they're projectors and they're, the purpose of the project is to make a profit. So he had all the components of uh, laissez-faire capitalism, um, some of them anecdotal, but mostly a system, his system of natural liberty, as he called it. And yes, I think the, the system uh, holds up under Smith. There are parts of it that obviously were improved on uh, over time, both in, in theory and practice. But yes, absolutely, you can call him a legend, if you like, of, of laissez-faire capitalism. Well, Hunter, the other thing is that he didn't hate those merchants, those projectors. You, I mean, that alone mm -hmm. is, a, is a shift from pre-classical thought. He, he, he saw them as necessary in a productive society and even uh, salutary to productive society as, as opposed to parasitical. Yes, very much so. And the... The thing he was against was crony capitalism, as we'd, we'd call it today. So he wasn't against the joint stock corporation. He was against the special privileges of monopoly that were granted to some of those corporations like the East India Company. And his whole story about um, firms and, and uh, capitalists getting together to, to, um, to manipulate prices is about special privileges, about the crown uh, granting monopolies to privileged groups. So yeah, the merchant, the butcher, the brewer, the baker, um, all of the individuals, the farmers, the speculating merchants, yes, this is a this is a functioning society, a beneficent society, and one that has potential uh, to raise uh, everybody's wealth and everybody's prospects. So we will finish up here with chapter 17, the last chapter in volume one. It's pretty brief. It's titled the spread of the Smithian movement. And in this chapter, Rothbard talks about Smith's thought beginning to dominate British thinking. After the 1790s, there's a shift of influence back to London 
in the early 1800s. And Jonathan, I want to ask you about this. He goes into Bentham a little bit here and his uh, writing called In Defense of Usury. Uh, so even though uh, B- Benthamite thinking is influenced by Smith's thinking, uh, there are some distinctions made here. And one interesting thing that stood out to me is that uh, Bentham appears to hint at the notion of time preference. He talks about exchanging present money for future money. So maybe we should uh, view Bentham as a, uh, a, a proto-Austrian in, in terms of his understanding of interest. That's right. It's another good example of Rothbard, uh, you know, finding the little bits of good in thinkers that he would consider as, you know, generally uh, not so good. So, yeah, you're right. Uh, he, did, he did point out that Bentham... Uh, when he was defending interests, uh, you, you have to remember that, like back in those days, that the the fact that people would charge interest for loans was a very contentious. That was that was a very big debate that they were having D- throughout the uh, history of economic thought for centuries before this as well, um, where a lot of people were relying on certain verses from the Bible to to say that there there should be no uh, interest charge on loans that. That is especially, you know, people who belong to the same religion, people who are who are both Christians, they should they shouldn't lend at interest to a Christian brother. And so they would use that as grounds to to outlaw any interest at all, or at least argue for outlawing interest. Um, and so when, when you see authors um, like uh, Juan de Mariana earlier in the Spanish scholastics um, and also Bentham here, when they start to say, well, you know, it's not the case that. If somebody is charging interest, it's not the case that they're just exploiting the other person, or they're you know they're trying to injure the other person. Um, it, it's simply the fact that there's it's simply the fact that money in the future is not worth as much compared to money today. So yet we had to discount we had to discount money in the future or place a premium on money in the present. And and Bentham, as Rothbard points out, was the first one in Britain to point out that. The underlying cause of this is is time preference. It's the fact that we we prefer the present uh, compared to the future. Well, this chapter also spends quite a bit of time going to Thomas Malthus. We all know Malthusian thought, uh, his famous 1798 essay on the principle of population. My sense was that Rothbard hangs Malthus on Smith, uh, perhaps a little unfairly, but nonetheless, uh, this idea that but you know, population is going to exceed the uh, subsistence ability of uh, the economy. You know that Hoppe talks about that, but he's talking about pre-agrarian societies. He's talking about early human societies, which are utterly reliant on the game or other sustenance they can yield from a particular area. And so, when they have more and more kids, and, and the, the region is not replenishing that game or other sub. Uh, subsistence uh, rapidly enough, then that'll naturally limit the size of the tribe. But here, I mean, it, it, it seems clear and obvious to us in hindsight that Malthus is a bit of a crazy person with his, uh, you know, obsession uh, with uh, population size. And that's the ultimate central planning, wouldn't it be? If, if a government or a nation state said, well, we got to listen to Thomas Malthus and control how many kids people have. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask Hunter what... You, what, what's what's the story with this uh, cul-de-sac of Thomas Malthus and the time Rothbard spends on him? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. He was trying to, I think, denigrate Smith by saying Smith was responsible for Malthus. Right. As he, as he was ultimately responsible for Marx, which I don't buy that uh, connection. If you read Smith, he said there could be a tendency in um, in uh, pre-agrarian or agrarian societies – for um, population growth to outstrip the productivity of agriculture, but it never happens because uh, innovation and and productivity and the specialization of labor always get us producing more and more, and that grows faster than the population grows. Um, And I think Rothbard says that um, Malthus had to admit that in the final edition of his book, which was much different than the first edition, which was the crazy edition. So mm-hmm. uh, A, you can't hang it on on Smith, and B, Smith probably changed Malthus's mind. Well, I'll let Jonathan have the last word, and, and uh, Hunter brings up the idea of even trying to hang Marx on Adam Smith. And so I want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, in the final pages of the book, Rothbard essentially says, look, the, if you accept the labor theory of value, or the production cost theory of value, which 
uh, supposedly, presumably everyone did, and some many people still do, but everyone did prior to the marginal revolution, um, that this necessarily and inexorably and naturally leads us to Marxism. Uh, do you agree with this or is this hyperbole? I, I guess we can't really know if if Marxism would have been developed, if Marx would have developed all of his ideas without Smith. So w- would there have been this idea of exploitation of labor because because we see that the the price of the product is more than what's being paid to to laborers? Or would we have this idea of alienation? Or would we have all these other ideas associated with market, Marxism that we that we see sort of, you know, vague beginnings in Smith. We can't really know for sure what would have happened or how, how the, the history of ideas would have, would have developed. But perhaps if, if it's the case that those ideas would have developed without Smith's writings, or even if Smith had been stronger on the, you know, the natural rights, natural liberty, uh, system of natural liberty ideas, if he had been more explicit there, it, it could be that Rothbard is giving Smith more credit than what Smith is due. So it could be that that Rothbard is 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 elevating Smith's uh, importance in the same way that he's denigrating others who elevate Smith's importance. If, if that makes any sense. So it's almost like he's saying all these people uh they they praise Smith and they they uh think that his writing is just amazing and and it was he's the founder of modern economics. But if Rothbard in the same breath says, look at all of these things, all these bad ideas that that start in Smith, um, it it could be that that Rothbard is, you know, committing the same error that he's accusing others of doing it, which is, you know, giving too much credence, uh, giving uh, a Smith too much credit um, there. But but what's interesting is to compare this book to the book that Mark Skousen wanted this book to be. Uh, I've used I've used both books in in my own uh, classes of history of economic thought. I, I've assigned readings from Rothbard, but I've also um, assigned Mark Skousen's book. Uh, this book, uh, Rothbard's book, was initially commissioned by Skousen to be a, a short undergraduate uh, textbook on history of economic thought. Um, but when when the project was taking longer than both Rothbard and Skousen anticipated. Uh, Skousen decided to write his own um, version, and also uh, Rothbard uh, died in the process. So, but if you compare the content of the books, they're totally different, especially in their treatment of Smith. Uh, wh- what's really interesting is that Smith is at the end of Rothbard's book, but Smith is at the very beginning of Skousen's book. So Skousen sets up his history of economic thought as it all began with Adam Smith and it, it, we had all of these great ideas that you know started you know as little seeds in Adam Smith and turned into this this great project of free market economics later on, including he would put Austrians in that same vein as you know uh, economics that's based on you know free market principles. But then when you read Rothbard, it's the exact opposite. It's very it's very dense. It's very detailed. Adam Smith is not the founder in the slightest. In fact, he wrote a whole book that's about economics before Adam Smith. And then once he finally gets to Adam Smith, he doesn't have a lot of nice things to say. So it's really interesting just to see how those two books turned out. Well, I guess the jury will remain out on Smith until next week when we cover (laughs) volume two of this book. We're going to get into Ricardo and John Stuart Mill and Karl Marx and all that fun stuff with some more great guests. And if we know anything, uh, Jonathan, it's that dying doesn't stop Murray Rothbard from writing books. Uh, he's still, uh, we're still finding them and he's still producing them. But, you know, I want to thank both of you. Hunter, I think that was a really uh, an excellent and insightful and thoughtful defense of Smith. And it's, uh, it certainly made me think more about it. And uh, Jonathan, I want to thank you for coming on with your Rothbardian take on all this. It's really fascinating stuff. And I want to encourage people to read the book for themselves. It's available in a beautiful free PDF at the Mises.org website. Just Google an Austrian perspective on the history of economic thought. And uh, for a non-economist like myself, I got to say, this is a lot more fun. It's easier reading than uh, human action or man economy and state by far. And I really encourage people who have an interest in this uh, to take a little bit of time and check it out if you're looking for some new reading. So Hunter and Jonathan, thanks a million again. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.